My name is Keevan McCord, and I'm a gallery educator at the National Portrait Gallery, where we tell the story of the United States by portraying the people who shape the nation's history, development, and culture. I'm excited to share with you a looking and thinking strategy that we use in the gallery called Jumping In. This is a wonderful strategy to engage your students, especially the younger students about grade three and below, although it definitely works for older students as well. And it's a way to have them work on their creative thinking, critical thinking, and language skills. So we use portraits, which are likenesses of individuals or representations of people, to teach a lot of subjects at the museum. And these portraits are composed of a variety of materials. The media of a portrait could be a painting, a photograph, a sculpture, a print, even time-based media like videos. And we have all of these represented in our collection. So it's a great way to discuss art. And you can also discuss the biography of all of the sitters in our collection. The sitter is the person who's being shown. But they have all made important contributions to the United States and the development of the United States. So not only can you learn a lot about an individual, but also about the history of this country. So there's plenty of opportunities for you to incorporate our collection in your classroom. And after demonstrating Jumping In, I'll describe to you how you can access some of our online resources. So let's jump in. In the museum, I'll bring the students to this portrait. It's on our third floor, and it's a bit larger than life-size oil painting. But as I'm demonstrating now, you can definitely use this object virtually, or if you have your students in your classroom, you can also project it onto a screen. So I'll explain jumping into my students. I'll explain to them that I'm going to have them pretend to shrink their bodies down to be a bug. And at the count of three, they're going to bop their bodies and mimic jumping in to the portrait. And once they've landed somewhere, I'm going to ask them questions about what they observe from where they've landed. So I'll have them do the countdown. One, two, three, bop. And it's great because you can also incorporate some movement in your lesson. Now, the students have jumped in. I'll call on a few volunteers, depending on how much time there is. I might get to the whole class. And I'll ask a student, where did you land? This is a great opportunity for your students to practice using detailed descriptions. So for example, if a student says, I landed on a tree, you can follow up by asking them to be more specific. But well, which tree was it? What color is the tree? Are there any shapes on the tree where you landed? Where is the tree in relation to the sitter? Depending which vocabulary words you want your students to be practicing in the language of instruction, you can frame your questions appropriately. So in this case, the student has answered, I've landed on the tree on the right side of the painting, and it's the one with the V in it, and I'm up on the top of it. So you say, perfect. Now, I'm going to ask you about your observations from where you've landed. And this observation question is going to be based on one of the five senses. So for this, I might ask my student, from your vantage point, what do you see? And the student says, I see a butterfly. Well, you can get more detailed here. Well, how large is the butterfly in relation to you? Oh, well, I'm small, so the butterfly is huge. You could ask, do you see any patterns or designs or colors on the butterfly? And the student might respond, yes, I see many white dots on kind of bluish, purplish wings. Beautiful. Now you can go to another student. And in this case, the student might say, I landed on the spider web, which would be a perfect opportunity to incorporate the sense of touch. And you can ask the student, well, what does it feel like on that spider web? And they might say, oh, it feels kind of sticky or silky. Or they might even say, oh, I feel a breeze, so it feels kind of windy. Wonderful. Now you can go on to another student. And this one perhaps has landed on top of the sitter's shoe. And you can say, well, from down there, what do you hear? And the student might say, well, I hear the wind rustling the leaves. Or they might get even more creative and say, oh, well, the sitter's wiggling his foot a little bit and it's crunching the leaves. So I hear that sound. So you continue through for as many students as you have time for to get their observations. It's a wonderful technique because before you even know anything about the sitter, the students can become engaged with this portrait. 
they can get the opportunity to put themselves in someone else's shoes, in this case, in a bug's shoes, and see things from a point of view that's different from what they're accustomed to seeing. It requires them to think creatively and really immerse themselves in the scenery to get a feel for what it might be like. This jumping in technique works very well with portraits that have detailed settings. In this case, outdoor is ideal because I've asked my students to pretend to be a bug. But you could do it on an indoor setting as well, and you could just encourage your students to pretend that they've shrunk down, or that they're still their own bodies, and ask them about their observations from where they have landed in an interior setting. Now that we've completed jumping in, we could move on to talk about the biography and this man's important contributions, but I like to take this looking strategy one step deeper by asking my students to read the portrait. Now, reading the portrait means that the students are using their observation skills to look for clues that the artist has included to tell the sitter's story. So these clues include things like objects, setting, pose or facial expression, clothing, even the medium or the material that the artist is using and their style can help tell the sitter's story. And so for this, I start with object. And I have the students look closely at the object in his hand, which I've zoomed in on here. And I'll ask them to describe it. And the students identify that he's holding a stick that's covered with ants. And the careful observer will even notice that he has an ant on his hand. I'll have my students strike this pose. I'll have them hold a stick, pretend to hold a stick in their hand. And if there's space available, even have them crouch down like he is with one knee up and one knee down. Now, once they've got a stick covered with ants in their hands, I'll ask them to make a facial expression that corresponds to how they feel when they're holding this object. And this is really fun because many students will kind of recoil or grimace a little bit. Some might even drop their stick. <laughs> um, and so you can ask them about their reactions and how it made them feel. Some students, though, their expressions might resemble the expression here on the sitter's face, which I'll zoom in on as well. And now's the time to ask the students, well, how do you think he feels? And many of them will say, I think he feels happy or comfortable or at home with an, a stick full of ants in his hands. And if they use those adjectives to describe him, I might say, well, what is the clue? What particularly did the artist include that helps you understand that he's happy or comfortable or at home in this setting? And this is when the students will observe his smile, maybe like the, the smile marks on his face, the fact that his eyes are kind of twinkling a little bit, he's gazing out, he's not recoiling. They might observe that his pose is kind of rooted. He doesn't need to go anywhere. He's at home here. They might observe that his clothing looks like he's dressed to spend the day in the wilderness. He's not out of place in this jungle setting. Uh, in fact, he even lets the ant crawl on him. That's how comfortable he is. And so now your, art, your students have used their observation skills without any label information, without having to read any text. They've visually read the portrait to identify a gentleman who is comfortable with ants crawling on him, <laughs> who loves the study of bugs. This gentleman's name is E.O. Wilson. After your students have jumped in and read the portrait, you can discuss with them his biography and his important contributions to science. He's one of the world's leading experts on ants, and in particular, he has studied exhaustively the way that ants communicate. So I thought this was a particularly appropriate portrait to use with world language teachers because it's about how animals communicate in nature, and you can use that as a springboard to talk about the importance of communicating across cultures and across different languages. The Portrait Gallery has no shortage of images that you can use in your classroom. All the sitters in our collection have made an important contribution to the history of the United States or to its culture and development. And so if you have a sitter that you'd like to use in your classroom, you can go to our website, which is npg.si.edu, and either add the slash portraits or scroll through from the home page to get to our portrait search. There you can type in the name of the sitter that you're interested in using in your classroom. And the corresponding images will show up 
Most of them uh, include label text that's in English, and the majority of those that are in, have been written in English have also been translated into Spanish. So you can get some background information on your sitters there, and you can download the high quality images to use in your classroom. And another amazing resource I wanted to let you know about today is called the Learning Lab. This is a Smithsonian-wide tool at learninglab.si.edu where you can either create or use collections that have already been created. Um, you can create collections that incorporate material from across the Smithsonian, millions of resources from videos to objects to audio. You can even create little quizzes for your students to incorporate when they're learning about portraits. And I want to demonstrate to you how this website works. If you go to learninglab.si.edu slash org slash mpg, you can get to our organization page, which looks like this. From here, you'll see numerous collections. The spotlight's on reading portraiture, which I'll go to in a moment. And we've also categorized our collections by contemporary conversations. We've got interdisciplinary approaches, certainly opportunities to use our collection in multiple subjects. We've got exploring identity, which is a wonderful theme to use um, in your classroom. Historical inquiry. We have student experiences. These very closely resemble what an in-gallery tour would be like if you were to come to the museum based on a variety of themes. Some of our collections include inspiring individuals, so you can find a collection just on E.O. Wilson, for instance. Early learners, we have coloring pages here. This Strike a Pose is a short video you can use in your classroom where your students see an object for a few um, seconds and strike the pose of the sitter. Close looking, opportunities to slow down and look closely like we did when we jumped into the portrait with E.O. Wilson. And then at the bottom here are resources created by educators outside of the portrait gallery who have um, hashtagged their collection with NPG Teach, and then it gets fed into this organization page. So to see what a collection looks like, this is what the Reading Portraiture, a Guide for Educators collection looks like. And you can see all of the tiles that have some very, um, very important information for you from our Reading Portraiture Guide that you can download to give you some tools for using portraiture in the classroom to some videos about coming to the museum. Here we've got important definitions of words that um, we use when we discuss portraits, including the elements of portrayal that we described. And here you'll find some learning to look strategies, like the jumping in technique, along with portraits that make sense for that strategy. Other examples include strike a pose, creating a puzzle out of a portrait, and at the bottom here, we have additional resources and opportunities to read portraiture in your classroom. So I encourage you to check it out. It's a phenomenal resource, and I think you'll find great utility in using our collection in your classroom. So thank you all very much, and we look forward to hearing from you how you have been successful at incorporating our collection into your world language courses.